everyone, it's going to be a real tight fit. So if you can kind of consolidate in or be well, no, just know people are going to be sitting next to you. Come on in, come on in. Come on in. Hey, go ahead and find seats. Like, there's plenty of seats in the middle, seats down front. It's going to be a very packed house. Come on in, there's plenty of room. There's some seats down here, there's some seats up there. Just there's some seats over here, there's three down here. If you have a seat, hang on everybody, listen real quick. It's going to be a very tight fit to get everybody in. If you have seats open next to you, raise your hand so that we can. Uh... All right, so we got a couple of seats down here. We got, there's two seats down here. There's not? Gotcha. Yeah, there's a seat down here. 
I think we're about to just shut it off and do the overflow. Hey, uh, Tracy and Kim, I think we're going to start sending people to the overflow room. Yeah. I've got one seat down here for anybody that needs a seat. And there's one right there. Um, are there is there two right there? And there's two seats right here. There's two right here. There you go. There's one right there. There's one down here. There's one. There's a. I've got another seat up there as well too. Isaiah. All right. All right, everyone. It is. Uh. It's one fifteen. Well, it's after, it's 117. All right. Hey, I, everyone, I need your attention. All right, I know you're all excited to be here. So if you can, I ask that you chill for just a second. Let me make some announcements. Let's, let's get this thing started. Um, let's get this thing started. Let's be on our best behavior and uh, that way we can get through this. We've got a great program planned for you. So um, first of all, I just want to welcome everybody to our third annual Jacket Days. Um, this is our keynote session. Um, and I hope that you all had a great time this morning when you met with your instructors. We have a great program planned out over the next two days. Um, we've got more than 50 different individuals that are going to be coming um, from off campus to speak with you all. We have over 100 sessions, workshops, and activities. So throughout these days, I encourage each of you to pay attention, to ask questions, and use this time as an investment in yourself. There's no other school in America that dedicates the beginning of the semester to career readiness. It's my sincere hope that each of you will discover your passion, engage with professionals in your field, and formulate a plan for after graduation. With that being said, I'd like to remind everyone to silence their cell phones and refrain from holding side conversations during the presentation. Restrooms are located out in the lobby across from the auditorium in case anybody needs that. I know y'all all had the calf today, so. Uh, all right. I probably shouldn't have said that. See, they were being good. All right. So, um, with that being said, it is it's now my pleasure to introduce the 19th president of Defiance College, Dr. Rich Ann Mankey, to offer a few welcoming remarks. President Mankey. Great to see you all. Welcome back. Hope you had a nice break. Lots of learning to happen today, but lots of fun, too. As Dr. Taylor said, today's our third day, or third year of Jacket Days, and I want to thank Dean Taylor, Dr. Caldwell, and the staff of Career, the, the Institute for Career Readiness and Lifelong Learning for taking an inkling of, idea, of an idea and turning it into Jacket Days. Like he said, nothing else in the nation. So could you join me in thanking them? Secondly, I say that I hope as students and future DC grads that you take this seriously and that you engage creativity and your learning to help you embark on the next steps of your career, whether that's an internship, doing, a better, doing your job a little bit better when you're working on campus or off campus, whatever it is. In some cases, we know what we want to do. My brother knew what he wanted to do when he was 10, and he still does that today. I did not. And many of you are in that same boat. I thought, and you, some of you have heard me say this before, but I'll say it again, I thought I was going to be an English and German high school teacher. That's what I went to college to do. 
But then I found something called being an RA. And I found out that you could be a college administrator and you could do that in student life. And I found a different way and a different major. I went from being English and German education to psychology and sociology. It's the best thing I did. But I didn't even know I could do that when I started my college career. And I think many of you are in a similar boat, finding out that there are many opportunities for you. And that's what this is about. Learning what those opportunities are, exploring them, and what it takes to do them and do them well. So I get ahead of myself. I mean, what else I want to say to you? But you know, this is a great time and a great opportunity. I'm old. You all are young. You're going to have 60 people coming from off campus. They're going to listen to Gina, Gina Valentino today, and you're going to hear some things that may not make sense to you at this stage of your life and career, project down the line. Because there are so many things that we learn, not just from books and from information, but from people's energy, how they engaged in relationships, how they networked a room and found out how things worked. It doesn't work like we say it does on paper, not all the time. So there's much learning to do. And we want to engage you so that you learn how the professional world works and how it's going to work for you and what things you can take away. Even if you don't like what someone's saying, you may in fact learn something from what they're saying. So that's what learning is about. That's what critical thinking is about. And that's what the competencies that Jacket Gabe teaches is about. So enjoy, learn, and thank you very much. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Caldwell, who will give you a brief introduction and then present our keynote speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon, students. Welcome back. It's great to have you all here. Look at this auditorium filled with future DC alums and proud graduates. And we are thrilled that we're going to be part of your journey, whether you're just starting as a first year student or you're a junior and you're getting ready to formulate your plan and this will be uh, closing in on your end of your career here next year. So allow me to piggyback on President Mankey's thanks, but I'd like to specifically ask the staff and the team from the Institute for Career Readiness and Lifelong Learning to please stand wherever they are. And folks, when you put on a, an event like this, it takes months, 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 months. So please join me in thanking Dr. Taylor, Robin Ote, Nicole Hoffman, Tracy Army, Kim Esquivel, everything you, everything you see from the QR codes to the thank you gifts to the speakers to the escorts on campus to arranging every division being in the rooms and helping with sessions, Dr. Taylor and his team did. And so they've done a really great job and they've done this for you. So please, as the president said, and I'm gonna say, take advantage of this. As I was sharing earlier today with the section of 201s, Rarely in life do you ever get to think about your life, right? We're always so busy living our life. We got our phones. Oh, where am I? Where do I need to be next? Oh yeah, doctor called me, told me, told me I needed to be in here at 115, and you are. We live our lives constantly by calendars and schedules and our relationships with others, but we don't often think about for ourselves. Whoa, what is it that I want to do? What is it I need to do? These three days allow you that luxury. So please take advantage of it. Talk to the speakers. Grab President Mankey, ask her a question. Grab me, we're all around. We're happy to share with you our journey and how we have become who we are and what we've done, what we've done well and the mistakes we've made. Because we've made mistakes, oh, I've made a lot of mistakes in my career. Uh, and this is your opportunity to ask all of us. And to kick us off is a small, private graduate from Adrian College, just north of us here, a uh, friend and colleague who I've known for many, many years now, Gina well, Valentino. Yeah, yeah, that's Gina. Here, everybody. That's Gina. <laughs> exactly. She's here and she's ready. You're going to have some fun with her. So <laughs> Gina was a, marketing, was a marketing major at Adrian College. Oh, no, no, no. You're coming back. <laughs> Sorry. 
You're coming back. You can have fun with Gina in a minute. Come back to me. Thank you. So because you do need to hear her story. So she graduated from Adrian College, and throughout her career, she has worked with various Fortune 500 companies that you are very familiar with. She's worked for Disney. She's worked for Home Depot. She's worked for Tom Shoes, Hickory Farms, and Little Baby Clothes, Oshkosh Bagash. After many decades of working in creative marketing and working with these companies, she decided in 2006 to start her own company called Hemisphere Marketing headquartered in Kansas City, Missouri. She serves on many boards. So in other words, she doesn't just run her business. She gives back to the community. She serves on many boards and supports many, many philanthropic organizations and causes. In particular, she serves as an instruction coach at the Henry, Henry w, w. Block School of Management at the University of Missouri. She is smart. She is very knowledgeable. And she's a lot of fun. So let's give her a warm yellow, yellow jacket welcome, Gina Valentino. Gina's in the house, people. <laughs> that is so lame. I'm short. I'm short. Lame. What's going on? All right, so we're gonna have fun today. Uh, not really. <laughs> How much fun can you have in a lecture hall with someone yam, 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 yammering, yammering? I'm gonna try and make it as fun as possible because I've been in your shoes, not only as a student, but boy, being a business meeting like this, and honestly, it's all you can do not to fall asleep, and you're like, get to the point, people. But you can't say that unless you're me and then you get fired. So don't, don't, let's learn from me. Don't do those things, don't do those. Uh, I grew up in an Italian family. I have cousins like Giacomin and Fortunad and my brothers are Rocco and Mario. I thought everyone had Italian families, never occurred to me otherwise. Uh, but I went to a small private school like yours. I went to Adrian College in Adrian, Michigan. And my family was poor, but everyone was poor. So I didn't know I was poor. I just knew that I had bigger ideas. I wanted to do bigger things. I didn't want to be in Michigan my whole life. It's a, a wonderful state. I love the Midwest. I'm glad to be back. But I lived on the coast. I, I've experienced life. And I couldn't have done that without my college education. So getting your education is your ticket anywhere. So use the knowledge you gain over these next four years. We're seniors. This is your last year. Kick it into gear, people because you are gonna to wanna to succeed however you define it. So if you wanna be at home, be at home, but be the best at home person. If you wanna be a burger flipper, you know what, why don't you own the company then? So do whatever you wanna do, but you have to learn the lessons from school. Education is key. Learn what you don't like and learn what you do like. And if it comes easy to you, please don't discount that. That means you have a gift. If something comes easy to you and you're successful at it, don't act like, well, it must not matter because it's easy for me. You know, I thought that for the longest time. Marketing and um, getting people to buy things, <laughs> surprising, you know, can I sell you an igloo? Seriously, I'm, I could sell anything. But I also found that postal regulations made sense in my head when it, nobody else, like I can look at a mail piece and tell you what your postal discount is. Yeah, okay, Rain Man, you know, <laughs> it's just, I thought that was not only odd, but it was a gift in my industry. So as I grew in the catalog world and direct mail, I became an industry expert. And through that, they say after 10 years, you're an expert. Well, I've had my own company 17, and I'm a smidge older than all of you. So that gives you an idea of how long it took. But please know as soon as you graduate, you're not gonna get your dream job. That won't be your career. Everything is a decision and a stepping stone to what you want to become and that will change all the time. All right, so I'll just talk a little bit about that. I have a couple of trivia questions in there. Um, I wanna give away some prizes, and I invite you to interrupt, but I think we have microphones around, yes? Thank you. Look for the microphone to ask your question. Um, I want this to be about you and what you gain from it. And if I talk in an acronym, go, hey, acronym, because we all do that, it's not nice because you don't know what we're talking about. 
So um, for today, I want you to know that your career won't be a straight path, that luck, all of you have luck waiting to happen because you're going to be prepared and it's going to meet an opportunity. And that's what I'm going to tell you how I got to Disney. And always make a good decision. And sometimes, it, you know, honestly, it's not going to work out. It may not be the right decision. But go through the steps that you decide how to make a right decision. And I'm going to show you what my steps were when I made a really big career change where I took a demotion. But was that the right thing to do? Or was that really stupid of me? You're going to find out. And then science feeds all creative. So because I'm in the creative world, I decided in 2006 to start my own ad agency, but I just focus on catalog and direct mail because that's what I know. I don't work on the internet. I know enough to be dangerous. People say, do you do any offline? I do not. I'm print, 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 and it's king of the world because that's where all the money is because then you go online and buy. So I stayed, at, I stayed relevant. And then um, being new, all of you will be new in the marketplace. That is advantageous, and I'm going to tell you why. And I'm also going to tell you what happens when I know you're new and you don't let me know you're new, and that will be detrimental to you. And then we're going to test your knowledge, so that'll be fun. All right, so I'm from the class of 1986 at Adrian College. Yeah, all right, people. <laughs> all right, that, that's about enough of that right about now. Okay, that's nice. That, that's real nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. All right, so I grew up in Lincoln Park, so I put the arrow, Lincoln Park is just southwest of Detroit, and then um, I went to school in, a oops, I went to school in Adrian, and that's where the little cap is, so you have an idea, it's between Ann Arbor and north of Toledo, so that's, I only drove an hour, you know, to school, and back then, you had to carpool with people, because <coughs> back then, many people only had one vehicle, yeah. Oh, kids today. All right, so in Lincoln Park, um, this is where I grew up. That uh, Five of us grew up in that little baby tiny house. But again, everyone grew up that way, so I thought nothing of it. And when I went to school back in 1982, that was the cost of tuition. $6,996. Uh-huh. Full year, one year tuition. Now, I tell you that because it seems cheap right now, but my dad paid 12500 for that house. So for him to send me to school that cost 56% more for one year of tuition for the whole house he bought, he's like, uh-uh, that's not happening. You're, you're not going to that school. Well, he was Italian and a guido, so he didn't do that. But um, I, I, I said, I have to go to that school. I, I will fail anywhere else if I don't go to that school. And I swear my parents almost got a divorce over it, but through finding grants and my mom picked up a second job, my dad was a teacher, so you know those salaries, but we made it happen, and I went to Adrian College, and that's where I graduated, and those four years were important to me because I knew it was my ticket out. I knew if I got that education, I would have enough in my arsenal to go anywhere. I, for whatever reason, when I was younger, I always knew I wanted to be in marketing. I wanted to do something in that arena that brought people together to help them buy. I don't even know why I knew that, but it was just part of me. But you know, the thing was, I thought I was gonna be a copywriter. Well, I stink at that, so <laughs> that didn't happen. But I knew that I wanted to do something big and I wanted to work at a big company. I didn't care what big company. I knew I just didn't wanna work at Ford Motor, Chrysler, or GM. I just didn't. I, I was going to die if I did that. So when I was at Adrian, I did everything on campus I could to build my resume. So I worked at the campus radio station. I worked in the dining hall. I gave campus tours like some of you do. Um, I worked on the newspaper and I became an RA, then an RD, um, did admissions counseling. I mean, anything I could do to earn money, I did. And I won the mock award. I know this is no surprise. Miss everything, all the time, everywhere. I was this girl. And on top of that, I was class president. So to this day, my class from 1986, we get together every five years on campus. 
and that's just, and, oh my word, sorry. <laughs> As you um, know your classmates and you become one, you get together and it just feels like old times. It's wonderful. So with that, I earned my bachelor's of business administration and I thought, all right, all right, done, out, peace out, I'm gone. But the pro, what am I doing over here? Tell me. You know, can, can we get something over here, please? <laughs> Dr. Taylor. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Uh, not me. So what I thought the problem was back then um, in 1986, we were having a bit of a crisis in the country. Gas prices were soaring. They were almost, they were actually going over a dollar a gallon. And that was a lot back then. Gas Gas was at a shortage, you had to wait in line, and it was based on your license plate, odd or even license plate. That's how you could get in line for gas. That's how I grew up. I know, right? And unemployment rate through the country was 22%, unemployment rate. So when I graduated, I'm like, what am I gonna do? I wanted to leave, I wanted to get a good job, I got this education, what am I gonna do? So I'm at home, and of course I'm, you know, ready to graduate, and Oh, oh my God, the best thing. I forgot to tell you, I forgot to tell you. I was a bulldog. <laughs> and that stinky, ratty costume, that's me in there. That's me. And kids pulled on my tail and I didn't like it. <laughs> I know, there we go. All right, so when I graduated, um, I needed to do something, and back then, there was no internet, so every Sunday, the newspaper had the classifieds. You'd go through the classifieds, and just you send out your resume, send out your resume. Well, I finally got a job, eight mile in Greenfield, but in a good way. Um, again, remember, I lived in southwest Detroit. So I worked for an office supply company. Now, if anybody knows me, and you're gonna know me right now, I love office supplies. If I'm ever lost in a store, you go find the office supplies and I'm staring at pens. So that was my dream job. So now I am manager of marketing for 16 stores and we're doing um, like, so lots of uh, um, advertising and uh, I get to do direct mail. Now, direct mail back then was, used to take an X-Acto knife and cut out the image and put paste on the back and put it on a layout. That, that, it, there was no Adobe back then. I mean, it was physical work and I loved it. And I thought, isn't that just fascinating? People would buy something without touching it, without having it. And in my brain, I'm like, that's it. This is me. This is what I wanna do with my life. Now, how do I do more of it? I thought, well, education has always been my friend. So I'm gonna go back to school. And you know, if you're gonna go, people, go to Harvard. And that's what I, I applied, me, this girl over here, little Lincoln Parker, I know. I, but I can tell you, and all of you don't have this yet, but maybe you will, I have a Harvard rejection letter on my wall. <laughs> huh? But you know, if you're gonna go, go big. Ah. All right, so then I'm like, well, didn't get into Harvard, now what am I gonna do? Well, my parents, they moved to California, and my dad said, you know what, move here, college is free. I'm like, really? College is free. Well, okay. So I packed everything up and I moved to Beverly. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. My parents lived in San Diego, so that's where I moved. And it turns out education is not free unless you've been a resident. Well, I wasn't a resident. Now I needed a job still. So here I am. Now what am I going to do? I went to Neiman Marcus. I applied and I got a job at Neiman Marcus selling jewelry. I'm the best costume jewelry soloist person you're ever gonna find because these are my clients, Orville Redenbacher and Janet Jackson and George Hamilton. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you over there. Uh, they, at Neiman Marcus, I did such a good job, they wanted me to go into the management program. But you know, I didn't wanna do management. I, I mean, I'm good at it, but I wanted to do this marketing thing that I still had in my head. So again, Sunday newspaper comes out, I'm applying for jobs, and I wound up getting a job as the marketing manager, or I'm sorry, marketing um, uh, associate. It was a marketing associate at Roadrunner Sports. So some of you in athletics, you might know Roadrunner. Um, they have a catalog, they sell all shoes at a discount. 
They used to be the competitor to East Bay. Back in the day, East Bay and Roadrunner were always fighting for um, customers. Well, boy, this was awesome to me because I'm working on a catalog. I get to decide who gets mailed. Like, we're mailing 24 million people. I mean, it's not like onesie twosies here. Um, I'm forecasting revenue. Okay, if we mail that in, how much money should we get back? And then I'm doing advertising in magazines, and then I get to test promotions. If you give someone $10 off, is that better than giving them 10%? Do percentages work better than dollars? Well, the answer is, it depends what your threshold is. So if it's 10% off of $100, that works really well. If it's $10 off of 50, that's even better, because that percentage is better. So people perceive offers differently, so that's why you always test them. Well, I'm in heaven. I'm excited, and I'm doing math, which no one ever liked, but my dad was a math teacher, so how do you think my household was? Uh, I'm learning statistics. I understand significance. I'm running sample sizes. People in college, I thought, who does that? I'm going to be in marketing. Why would I need that? Like, yeah, yeah, regrets, you know? Learn your math. Learn simple math if you don't know anything else. And then you have to collaborate with others to come up with these ideas. So all of your group projects, I swear to you, they continue when you're older, even when you're close to 60. Um, you're in meetings and you have deadlines. So all the things you do today and throughout your collegiate career, you do them later. Those things don't go away. So learn how to deal with them now so you can be a great team player later. And the better team player you are, the more noticed you are, the higher up you go, the more money you make, your title changes, and most importantly, you have options. That's what all of this should bring you, is options. Hey, I might do this, I might do that. Have the options for yourself. All right, so I'm thinking, yay, I'm in marketing, I'm at Roadrunner. So I'm at a, a, back then you could go to conferences, and the catalog conference was like the big thing of the year, there's anywhere from five, seven, 10,000 people at these things. And this is early 1991, two-ish. I'm at a table, you know, the, the round tables, and they've always got the tabletops, and my table says the internet. You know who's at this table? Me, Todd Simon from Omaha Steaks, and Brian Doyle from J. Crew. three of us. Three of us at the table that says internet. I don't know, what are you going to do with this thing? I don't know, you think it's going to last? I, I don't know. Because, well, mind you, you can't buy anything off the Internet yet. This is very, this is beginnings of the Internet. Well, all right, well, we're going to, if someone emails us, and mind you, back then it was the CompuServe email where it was numbers and a few letters. Remember the old days? <laughs> Thank you. Remember the old days? Um, and we're like, well, if someone sends us a request for a catalog, I guess we'll mail them. I'm like, well, how many catalogs are you going to give out? Oh, maybe 100. I, I don't know. Oh, okay, so that was the internet back then. Now, I, I, I was like, all right, so come back to work. I decide, well, I better get my MBA since Harvard doesn't like me. I got my MBA, and the next year I'm attending another catalog conference, and I'm randomly seated next to the team from Disney. I, I knew Disney had moved their operations from New York to Burbank, so the Los Angeles area where the studio is, and I'm like, oh my God, this is my dream job. I am sitting next to these people. And back then, you always carried resumes with you. Wherever you went, you always had resumes. I handed them my resume and I said, I don't care if I sweep the floor at your office, I wanna work with you. And, and these people, uh, okay, lady. Or, well, you know, it was 25. And um, I gave them my resume, they folded it up, they put it in their bag. Three weeks go by and I get a phone call but I don't get a phone call on a cell phone because we don't have those yet. I get a phone call on the answering machine after work. I'm like, oh my God, Disney called me. Th they want to talk to me. I go through the entire process. They offer me a job and I'm, I'm overjoyed. I'm like, I'm set for life. I'm at Disney, career done, call it even. But I don't know if I should go because I need to make the decision long-term versus short-term. And the long term is, it's going to be great for my career. Who doesn't want Disney? I mean, I'm working at corporate Disney offices. It's a huge company with a lot of cachet. I'm going to be set for life. I don't know why I would say no to this. The no was, I'd have to move to Burbank. But, you know, that wasn't horrible. And there would be a learning curve a little bit. So I thought, okay, so far, long term and short term, good decisions. 
Now the work, I said there'd be a work, a learning curve, but the work was very similar to what I was doing, right? We're trying to get catalogs out the door, but it's a broader target market because, you know, frankly, it's a, it's a guilty purchase. What parent is going to give their kid Disney stuff if you have the opportunity to? So I'm like, all right, you know, I can do that. And then for the work, I'm no longer running the department. I was running the department over at Roadrunner. I'm running the p and I'm doing the budgets. I'm hiring my team. I'm running forecasting. I'm doing all that. Well, all that goes away. I'm just going to focus on doing the mailings. I'm like, well, I don't know, but I can do it. And then it would be a demotion in my title, right? I'm already a manager. Now I'm going down to um, the circulation coordinator position again. I'm like, or circulation specialist, I called it, they called it at Disney. And I'm like, well, I don't know. Boy, I really worked my tail off to get to manager. Um, but then I wrote, it's Disney. So I'm like, okay, so far I'm going to Disney. Then I thought, well, let's look at my life. I'm going to be moving away from my family, but you know what? It's a reasonable drive, so that's not horrible. And I'm likely going to be working more hours. So at that age, I thought, well, if I work a lot of hours, that's really going to help my career, so I think I'll do it. And then I was so excited to see what Burbank brought. I mean, I'm moving toward Los Angeles. I'm working at the studio, so I'm going to see all the movies and, and all the TV tapings. I'm going to eat in the commissary. I'm like, oh, this is going to be awesome. And then the compensation. The compensation was higher pay. Lower title, different work, but more money. I'm like, wow, I didn't know it worked that way. Okay, I'll take it. I'll take more money. And then all the Disney benefits that go with it, um, which was really cool. And then being a part of that, they call it, you're, you're a cast member. So I'm a cast member at Disney. So I'm like, all right, I think I like this. And then the last thing I do is I pray about it. And I'm not praying because, God, please give me what I want. I'm saying, God, help me understand if this is the right path for me to take. You know, sometimes God has to hit me over the head a few times before I, okay, I get it. I hear you. But that's what I'm praying for. I'm praying for guidance because I want to make a good decision for myself. And in my world, I, I believe God can help me do that. So that's what I did. All right. So who thought I went to Disney? Yay, I went to Disney. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. All right, so when I went to Disney, I, honestly, I, I'm like, I'm good. I'm, I'm going to retire here. My life is happy. I worked on the Winnie the Pooh catalog. I mean, who gets to say that? We had a Halloween costume contest catalog, and Demi Moore and her family called the company, and they wanted the you know outfit on the front cover, and Penny Marshall wanted to come to the sample sale. And I'm like, wow, this is kind of cool. I like all this. And then, because I was really good at my job, um, when Disney bought ESPN, I got to work on the ESPN catalog. GM had a car interior. Again, I got to be part of that team. And you guys, it wasn't because I'm some like intellectual wizard over here. It's because I always volunteered to help. I, I'm like, yeah, I'll help. I've got some time. You know, tell me what you need me to do. So I may not have been leading everything, but I was exposed to higher management. I was exposed to cross country, uh, cross company division leaders. And they're like, man, she's a good worker. Wow, she really got that done on time. She asked good questions. And then, hey, let's get her over here. I, it was the, so awesome for me. I was living the dream. And then, of course, I turned the corner one day and walked right into Marie Osmond. We were selling her dolls in the catalog. She's tall and beautiful. <laughs> it's like, wow. But you're not supposed to talk to celebrities. You know, you're supposed to move away but that was pretty cool all right so now you know I'm at Disney I'm rocking it I'm doing all these great things and then I attend another conference <laughs> so this was my first speaking gig and the president of a women's fashion catalog was on this panel I was speaking on and I just said just casually during you know our meeting time I said wow how cool would it be to live in Chicago well she heard that as I wanted a job. That's not, I wasn't saying that, but that's what she heard. So back then you would exchange cards. And so then she called me again on the, you know, machine at home and said, you know, we've got a job for you. You'd be running not only the marketing department, but all of creative and all of the internet. A and I said, I'm, I'm sorry, why are you calling me? She goes, well, you said you wanted to live in Chicago. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, it totally did not connect the dots. Well, I'm like, all right, well, I don't know. She goes, well, come on, we'll fly you out. Just come, come hear us out. 
Well, I did. I flew to Chicago, and again, it was at decision time. I had to think about long and short term. What about my work? What about my life? And Barry Pace was that catalog. And I couldn't turn it down. I'm running an entire division of a company that was owned by Hart, Schaffner, and Marx. And for you men out there who get tailored suits someday, the presidents of the United States go to Hart, Schaffner, and Marx and get their suits made. That's where I was going to be. I'm like, wow, kind of cool. And I, I was in my late 20s. I was going to live downtown. And I was making a lot more money. My salary doubled to do this. I'm like, uh, okay, I'll, I'll do this, sure. So I moved to Chicago in the middle of winter, and I turned around that division. I was super excited, and they didn't give me a bonus. They gave everyone else a bonus, and they said, it's because I started three weeks after the cutoff point. I went, excuse me? I'm the one that did all this. You guys were in the negative till I showed up. I didn't say that. Of course, you can't say that to people. Uh, but in my head, I'm saying it. And I went to the, man, to the president who I knew who hired me, and I said, I, I don't understand this. I said, you hired me to turn this around. I do this. We are in positive EBITDA, and I'm not going to get a bonus? Well, you know, those are the rules. I go, but you're the president. Well, I'm sorry. You guys, that was the very first time when I felt that contribution did not equal compensation. And I went, wow, all right, this is how the game's played. I, all right. And from that moment forward, I thought, okay, I'm gonna look for another job. I have a skill set. I know I can do all this. So I went to Spiegel. Now Spiegel at the time, um, they were the first company in the 1970s to offer women a credit card without getting their husband's signature. In the 70s. That's when that happened. Women had to have their permission of their husband to have a credit card. That's how that worked back then. So I went to Spiegel. I had 30 people in my department. I ran a $100 million division. I had statisticians from not only Russia, but China. I was kicking butt and taking names and loved every minute of it. And I was high enough in the company where I could see the glass ceiling. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna get there and I'm gonna break it. I'm gonna run this place. Well. Fate has a way of intervening. So Spiegel had stopped submitting their 10K to the government quarterly. And that's your quarterly taxes. Well, when a, a company doesn't do that, that's like a big, that's like a red flag. Like, huh, why, why aren't they paying their taxes? So I was high enough in the company. I'm like, you know what? This isn't going to go well. And I'm, I'm not going to stay here. <laughs> so what I did was, what I always do, I put my list together of what's my short and long term. So I called a company in Kansas City that I knew, and I said, hey, I'm gonna start looking for a job. They were a consulting firm. I said, you know, you guys work with a lot of people. What do you think about having my resume and you know, shopping it around? And they said, no, we won't do that. We wanna hire you. I go, you wanna hire me? He said, yeah, we love your skill set." I go, but I've never been a consultant. I, I don't know what to do. And they said, don't worry, you're gonna be a consultant, you're gonna be the vice president, general manager, but that means you're going to go on the vendor side of things, which means like you, you give services to the companies you work for. I'm like, okay, I can do that. So I could use my experience to help clients, but now I'm considered a vendor, but that's okay. Broader skill set, I could work with a whole bunch of companies and help them, and I love that idea. And I was willing to learn, that's the kicker. I've always been willing to learn a new skill. And as vice president and general manager, I'm running the company, all the day-to-day -day operations, hiring, firing, which is never fun, and you know, all the money, income, the expenses, the all of it. So now I know how to run a company. And after a few years, I was invited to be a partner, which now I'm in my late 30s. Who doesn't want to be a partner in their late 30s? So you know my decision-making process, I have to go through it. But you know what happened? I was on, was on assignment at the, um, Oblates of the Immaculate Conception, hmm. and it was Christmas time, and I had just driven through the nativity scene, the outdoor nativity scene where you listen to the music. It was so lovely, and back then we had blackberries. Blackberries were all the great, so I had my blackberry. I get back, and I'm staying at the convent, and I'm in the lobby, and on the blackberry, the red light shows up, and I look, and it says, hey, we've got your partnership paperwork ready, when you come back, let's talk to your lawyer and get this settled. 
I'm standing in front of the crucifix and I feel like an anvil is sitting on my chest. I can't breathe. I'm standing there and I'm like, okay, God, I hear you. This is not the right answer for me. Shouldn't a partnership be like the happiest day of your life, or at least one of them? Shouldn't you be overjoyed that you busted your tail and you're finally being recognized? But I, I couldn't. And two reasons. Um, I felt that I had a, a bigger calling. I, had, I felt like I, I needed to do something different. Now, part of it is because my dad had just passed away. So I had been, you know, when you step away from work, you know, you realize sometimes things are bigger than work. So when I got back to the office and all this is happening, I went, you know, I, I, I want to operate differently. I, I want to help clients learn how to do what I do. So then I can step out of a job and then go to the next one. Like, I don't want to be their person 24-7. I want to teach. So that's what I did. I turned them down. And it was a long process turning them down. We went through three weeks of back and forth. And, but when I said no, that lifted from my shoulders. I cannot tell you the difference it made in my life. And with that, I thought, you know, I'm going to start my own company. And I called it Hemisphere Marketing because I'd, I'd been tested at every company I went to because I've always been one of the youngest managers. Shout out to all you overachievers out there. You know, but people don't believe you're as good as you are. So I'd always been tested, and I test almost dead center on the left hemisphere of the brain and right hemisphere. So for those of you that get, get your left and your right mixed up, you're probably accessing both sides of your brain as quickly, and that's why you get your wires crossed. Now, I don't know if that's true, but boy, I love saying it. So <laughs> I felt, well, you know, it happened. So that's how hemisphere marketing came into play. But... I was considered an expert in my field. I had 15 years of doing it. And I knew the industry, the vendors, my network. I'm like, okay, this sounds pretty good. And then I had enough savings for one year. I thought, you know what? If I stink at this and I fail, I can at least pay my bills for a year until I get back on my feet. And I knew that URL, Hemisphere Marketing, was available. So I went to GoDaddy and bought that real quick. And that's, that's how I started. And I talked to my mentors my industry mentors about starting my own business. And nobody said no, they just said it's gonna be a lot harder than you thought, and it is. So I knew, and my mother would always say, hey, if you make that decision and it doesn't go well, what's the worst that's gonna happen? So I thought, all right, mom, the worst that's gonna happen is I will go back to corporate America. I've got the vitae, I've got the you know, resume to do it. So I launched it. And day two, I had three clients because people knew I was leaving, and so they came with me. And for that, I have worked with big and small companies my whole life. Well, okay, not my whole life, the past 17 years anyway. So when you get a catalog in the mail, it could really be my fault, right? And I don't, I don't talk a lot about what clients I work with because I feel that that, um, well, one, I, I have to sign a lot of NDAs, frankly, because I see their finances, I know their marketing strategies, so that's the one reason why I don't talk a lot about who I work with. But secondly, I think clients appreciate that I'm not trying to brag about, hey, I'm working with, you know, Home Depot, I'm working with Jockey, I'm working with whomever. Now, I don't work with Jockey and Home Depot anymore. Home Depot had four catalogs at one point that I was a part of. But now, in our world, it was a lot of money. In the Home Depot world, it was a decimal point error. They got rid of those catalogs. I was like, wow, that's pretty okay. All right, so um, I am starting my 17th year, and I wanted to talk to you just a little bit about what that means, and so we're going to do a couple quick things. Um, I use a lot of data to drive marketing strategies, and I want to understand shopping behavior. And in order to do that, I learn how the brain processes information. That is my difference. That's how I differentiate myself from any of you who want to go head-to-head -head with me on a marketing idea. <laughs> so I understand how the brain is working that way. And then I use those creative techniques to help increase response, to help increase the average order value, how much somebody is spending, or maybe how many items they buy per order. So that is what I do pretty much every day of my life. I live on a spreadsheet. And then the creative team, they will always say, well, it's not brand aligned. 
But if you're good at creative, you can develop tactics that support what the brain does in order to put it on a page. All right, so here's one of those tricks. For all of you in print, so, you know, something on a page, if you use this body copy, so that's a, sand, it's a serif type. Serif means it's got the feats, like a Times New Roman. So Gallup poll reading studies show that those, um, that something with a foot, so it could be Garamond, Times New Roman, they rank at the 67 percentile of reading and retention. So 100 percent's the best, so that's at 67. But what, what font do most of you use? Give me something. Oh, Arial. Mm -hmm. Somebody else? I can't hear you. You gotta yell. Seriously, nobody has any other font they use. Oh, Comic Sans. Yeah, you better not be using Comic Sans. Tell you that right now. You take that off. Yeah, stop. Oh, yeah, you're okay there. All right, so in print, in print, remember on paper, if you use body copy in a sans serif, so something without feet, reading and retention drops to only the 12 percentile. So on paper, what kind of font are you gonna use? A serif font, because you want people to read and retain what you give them, um, unless you don't. <laughs> there could be a circumstance, you're like, yeah, it's okay. All right, so a serif type scores nearly six times greater than a sans serif. So think about that the next time you're putting something on paper. The but in the sentence is, the web is the opposite. The website, anything on the internet, you need the sans serif something without feet. And that's because, as you know, computers use pixels. Printing uses dot matrix. Well, it's called dot game, but it, you know, dot matrix is a little easier to understand. So those serif, they get thinner on the strokes and it loses the game on the computer. The computer, because it's a pixel, can't hold it. And that's why that's so different, because you can't see it as well. So use that. All right, the next one, you're gonna love this. Reading a paragraph that's in all caps is a lot harder to read because your eye is talking to your brain and has to understand each letter individually versus the whole world, word. The brain tries to automatically look for references. It looks for patterns. So when you're reading, it's not just because you're yelling, it's because the brain can't see it. So reading a paragraph that is upper and lower case, that's much easier to do. The brain can now grab the words faster and process the information quicker. So a Times Roman, again on paper, upper or lower, scores at the 92 percentile. The all caps, they only score at the 69 percent. So that's why you wanna try to use upper or lower always and very sparingly use your screaming all caps. All right, next test. What's that say? Does it? You see how the brain wanted to put that all together for you. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so using color in creative, that's attractive, it's fun, but color should be used to organize something. You, you want, like if you're gonna use a background, you want all of it to be together so a reader understands, oh, this piece goes together. You want it to call attention. That's why you ever see sale prices are always in red. That's arresting, it's interruptive, it's alerting. That's why you put that in red and not, hey, how are you today? People are like, oh my God, why are you talking to me in red font? And then it should help the selling process. Now, text of high intensity colors, I know it's very hard to read. Um, they're, they're difficult to read, they only score at 76%, and then they have an overall comprehension at 10. I worked with one catalog company, they sold um, matching mom and daughter clothes, and the owner insisted that all the copy be the same color as the primary color in the outfit. I said, please don't do that, and here's why. No, 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 no. I said, all right, why don't we test it? Let's go ahead, we'll do it, we'll do it this way, but let's take a small percentage, again, statistically significant, let's get your sample size right, and we'll do it in, the, in uh, a regular black font. 
And sure enough, she could not believe the difference. But that's because when you're designing on a page, you're not decorating. That's the biggest fallacy is decorating a page versus designing to sell and have compelling behavior. You're trying to move people to do something. And that's a difference between marketing and decorating. So keep this in mind as you do things yourself, whether it's your resume or you're building a portfolio, think about how you're moving behavior. All right, here's another good one. Just reverse out copy. So, so many people want to put copy in the center. So ty typography, that's you know using text. It can't be about decorating or aesthetics. So copy and reverse out is one of the most difficult things to read. I know people like to do it, they think it's cool, but it doesn't work. Again, that's all about decorating versus selling. And then the other part is if you use that uh, serif, you know, something with the feet, uh, the, the reverse out text, the black ink, the black ink, it sees a problem being Italian, the black ink saturates the area and it won't hold the font. That's the other problem on paper. But if you want to do it, if you want to center copy, use short sentences and maybe do it once or twice. And then you can increase readability if you move your copy to be left justified and then use a sans serif for the best reverse out. So you can do these things if you know why we do them. And that's what I help teach people to do differently. And then these darn color combinations. Oh my goodness with this. Um, colors vibrate. And I know green and red is all about Christmas, but those are two of the most vibrating colors. So you really have to be careful with that. So um, I put the slide up so you have an idea of what colors work well together and which ones conflict. And that's always a problem. Blue on magenta. Cyan is blue, by the way. Cyan, that's a printing term. Cyan out of yellow. Magenta, again, printing term, it's a red out of green. All right, now we're gonna show you how this works in real life. So a company had hired, um, I speak at conferences, and so part of what I offer is, hey, if you wanna give me some of your pages, I will show you how to redesign them for free. But you gotta let me talk about them. I won't embarrass you, but you have to let me show the before and after and why we do things differently. So when we look at this, we see specials, send cut flowers. Can anyone give me one example of what I talked about that is wrong here? Just one example. Anybody? Yes, I can't see you, but go ahead. The background is noisy, absolutely right. Oh, yes, Tyler. That's right, contrasting colors on the text, perfect. See, you guys got it. Now, why, why these folks didn't get it? Come on now. The other problem is, um, do we care that you take MasterCard and Visa? Like, is that new to you? Do your customers not know credit card is offered? Do you see how much room they dedicate to that? And they're selling flowers which are fresh. So why not, here's the redesign, use the white background. Let the show flowers that you're gonna send people. Then say what you're gonna say, tell them. I mean, say what you're gonna sell. You want them to send fresh cut flowers. So we start there. Everything you see on the after is already on the before. It's just shown differently. Increasing sales, we talk about our specials, and now you see the footer has, um, of course, the page number, but now we put the URL and phone number. We don't need to indicate that somebody takes MasterCard and Visa. But you, you see what happens. But the difference in how the presentation is. But more importantly, does it make more money? Do you sell more? That's the goal, sell more, and we did. Now this other one, I, oh, I was presenting at the mail order gardening conference. Okay. There's also a Florida fruit shippers conference. <laughs> yeah, there are. All right, so here you see we're selling pruners. Well, wh what is the headline on all of these? They just say the name of the pruner constantly, constantly, constantly. And I'm like, well, I, I don't care. What does it do for me? So in this instance, the whole thing was they would ship everything you to free, ship everything to you for free. So why not lead with that? So now we've got free shipping, and then each um, pruner does something specific, and that's what you call out as your headline. Now we know. 
all right, if someone needs left-handed ones, we got them. But did you know that in the first one? Absolutely not. Did you know something was for, that was powerful, could cut a thicker branch? No, but now you do. So that's the difference in selling off a page and decorating a page. Make it, and you can kind of see it now that you have an A and a B. All right, a couple few things left. The um, left to right, the um, physiology of reading, our, we read left to right. The problem is if you do ragged left, which means the left side, so you see it all ragged, in and out, in and out, and it's justified on the right, that has horrible reading retention, only 10%. That's why you don't do that. You don't put copy and wrap it around something on the left-hand side. Just don't do it. It won't work. Okay? Don't even bother. Just don't bother. The um, other thing about point size of your font, the most comfortable reading fonts are 11, 12, 10, and 12. The problem is anyone over the age of 40, just slightly over the age of 40, um, needs to have the reading glasses. So Beyonce, Justin Timberlake, Kevin Hart, Gwen. Now, of course, Billy Eilish, she's 21. She didn't need them. <laughs> but that's what you have to think about when you're doing typefaces. All right, I told you I worked for a lot of you know, interesting companies. So this one, very exciting. Now, what you're seeing here is just a mop bucket and ringer, your everyday commercial mop bucket and ringer. Uline sells it. And Uline is a big catalog, and they sell a lot of um, stuff for the office, like cleaning supplies and such. Um, 26 quarter, they don't do a lot of copy. And then this other catalog company is called Global. They um, also sell it, but they do more copy because they have more uh, customer service info. Now, the client I work for <coughs> sells the mop bucket. But uh, I had to design it for their customer. The ultimate inmate mop bucket. Construction reduces the potential for making weapons. This girl, prison supply cataloger. And then I worked with the monks later that week, and then I went out to Fredericks of Hollywood. There's a horrible joke in there, but <laughs> let's avoid that. Yeah, you see what I'm saying. All right, so with this, I can't just say it's an everyday mop bucket. We have to understand for that customer what can be done. And now we talk about all the plastic can't be used as a shiv. That's nice, everybody. That's swell. I'm like, all right, what else do we need? And then we put a caption, no removable metal parts. So same mop bucket, everybody. Same mop bucket. Same mop bucket. It's how you market it to the customer. But these, they don't have to say all that. But, you know, the office of the um, prison supply company did. So that was a fun couple of years for me. I was glad that client was no longer mine. <laughs> uh, all right, your online resume. I know you guys are doing them. What I want you to think about is saying the same thing, but differently. You're going to be using the keywords that are in the job description. So. You have work that you've done, translate it to what the job needs. So here's an example. You manage the dining hall, and you do special events, including what will be on the menu, and of course, you're scheduling the staff and the students. But when you're looking for a job, you might read it and go, oh, I do supervise weekend catering, and I do do customized menus, and I coordinate the banquet teams. So they're calling it banquet teams, you're calling it special events. So you see how you have to change a little bit because nowadays resumes are read with optical readers. They're looking for keywords. When I was your age, you know, someone read the actual resume. Here's another one. You worked at the school newspaper, featured different stories about academics, athletes, community outreach. But when you're looking for a job, and I gotta tell you, so many clients need this position right here, writing content for the corporate events so they can post it online and repurpose for a weekly newsletter. You guys can do that. So look at the job description itself and then see how you can take what you do and translate it using the words in the job description. All right, here's for the famous person. No comic sans, none of that. No chiller, no ink, no stencil, please knock it off. Use basic sans serif. You know, Calibri's fine, you can use an Arial, 
um, especially for online resumes. Remember, I'm talking online, not paper. All right, here's where you're going to think. Maybe I'll give you a prize. I don't know yet. We'll see. Okay, so when you're proofreading, I got Procter & Gamble and Procter & Gamble. And the reason I put this one up here is yours truly was the only student at Adrian College to get an invite to go to Procter & Gamble senior year. My professor said, Gina, I want you to dial it down when you're talking to Procter & Gamble. Bring it down a little. Said, okay. Great job. I sent the cover letter. I spelled Procter & Gamble wrong. I've never done that since. And you want to know why? It's because I thought I knew. I never thought to look. I'm like, I always heard it one way. Why wouldn't it be a way? So in your head, you decide if it's A or B, or write it down. The next one is accommodate or accommodate. A has two C's and two M's. B has two C's and one M. Very common misunderstanding. Is it separate? or separate. And finally, could you care less or couldn't care less? You hear these a lot and I see it all the time being screwed up. All right, ready for the answers. Everyone got it in their head what they are? All right. Yep. Procter & Gamble's ER. That's not what I wrote. Mm -hmm. Yep. Accommodate, the way to remember that is because you're accommodating someone or something. There's two C's and two M's. One for me, and, I mean, two for you, two for me. So it evens out. Separate, you got the two A's. And the E's are the bookends. So you got to think of ways that you're going to remember it. And you couldn't care less. If you could care less, there's room to care. But you can't care less, so you couldn't care less. By chance, did anyone get all those right? And not the, not the grown-ups. Oh, serious? Oh, oh, the overachievers in the middle. Okay. Oh, oh, in the back row, overachiever. Both of you, seriously with me. <laughs> on this side, anyone on this side get it all right? Well done, well done. Yeah, don't, oh, oh. Over here, where? Who, who got it right? Oh, smarty. Mm-hmm. Nice, nice. That's that's awesome. That's awesome. Was there about? Is there about five of you? One, two, three. Four, oh, four. Oh, oh, you got a whole bunch right there. Mm-hmm. I don't know about that group. I know. I see you and you guys. Okay, that's awesome. Oh, all right. So on the job. Here, here's where you guys have the greatest advantage and you don't take advantage of it. You are new to the company, you're new to the department, you're new to the industry, you're new to the process, you're just plain new. And what you guys don't realize is that is your sole advantage because I don't expect you to know what happens in my organization. I don't expect you to know how we do things around here. But what I do expect is that you ask me a question. Because if you don't ask me, I don't think you care. Because I know you're new. You see how that is from an employer's perspective? I think you're not interested. You don't want to learn. You don't care to ask. Why aren't you raising your hand? Why, aren't you, why don't you want clarification? And then it kind of dawned on me. It, it's because we're new in an organization, we don't know how to ask those questions because we feel stupid. You know, we don't want to look like we don't know. But the problem is I know you don't know, but you don't know that I don't know that. So here I'm going to help you because I want you to succeed. Here's how to ask questions. And frankly, there are dumb questions. And the dumb question is because you didn't listen to what I just said, right? If you're listening, then you can ask clarification questions. But if you're not paying attention and you just ask me what I just told you, I kind of make a mental note of that and go, you know what? I'm not too sure that person's going to work out. And I, and I tell you, I pay more attention to that person because I'm like, I can't afford to have dead weight on my team. You know, we're moving and shaking. I got things to do. Let's go. And if you can't keep up, I need to know that early. So pay attention. All right. So here, um, here's where you have the advantage that 
I don't have. So what you can say is, hey, you know what? I learned about this in class, and I'm interested in how it, how it translates in the real world. Can you help me with that? Okay, I like this, this is good. Or about, will you walk me through the process? And somebody might say, you know, I will, let's finish the meeting and I'll get with you right after. We'll get with you after lunch. Or you can come up to them, hey, I know we talked about this, right? Say that you know that we talked about it, because now I'm like, okay, he listened. All right, I'm paying attention. She's looking at it the right way. Walk me through the process. I want to learn the right way, so help me understand. You know, I used this last week with a new client. In my industry, there's so much jargon. People use nomenclature like no one's business. Everyone's got their own acronym for something. And I've been in my career a long time, and I have to say, hey, I want to learn the right way. What does that mean in your world? I'm like, oh, wow, thanks for asking, right? There's no shame. There's no harm. They don't look at me like, who did I hire? They're like, she's engaged. She wants to learn the right way. Yes, I do. And then they keep hiring me for more money. I mean, they keep hiring me. And please be candid. Um, it's okay to say, I don't want to waste your time. Please let me know. When someone says that to me, especially for an overachiever, especially if someone's busy, when you say to me, I don't want to waste your time, my ears perk up. Okay, yeah, how can I help you? What do you need? I'm here for you because you don't want to waste my time. You don't want to make me stop and keep redoing something. Thank you. And then finally, I do this to this day. I'd like to provide an early draft. Would you please take a look at it so I don't get too far down the road on the wrong path? Heck yeah, happy to. Boy, that's great news. So with all of this, I hope you see, one, you can ask a question, but two, most importantly, you have to ask for feedback. And that's the biggest difference from academia to the uh, work life, to corporate America. When you do something in corporate America, you don't get feedback all the time. You don't do turn it in and get an A. You don't turn it in and get a C. You don't, you turn your working at work, keep going, next day, let's go. You, if you get a review once a year, God bless you, because it doesn't happen. That's why you have to, have to constantly ask for feedback yourself, or you will never grow. You will never learn something new. You will never be asked to do something bigger. So take that upon yourself. Know that once you leave the campus, work changes, and that's the biggest change in my mind. You don't get feedback right away. You have to ask for it. And then the nice thing is, all of you are going to have great ideas. You come with a mind and experience, and you have a level of interest and also technology that people my age don't have, that bosses won't have. I want your ideas, but there's a way to present them. And the way you say it is, hey, I see what you're saying, and I have an idea that might help save money, save time, save duplication of effort. But the thing is, don't go implement something just on a rogue idea. You have to ask first. Because always know there's a reason a company is doing it that way. And you don't have privy to it just yet. So that's why I want your ideas, because you're going to come up with stuff I won't even think of. You are approaching it very differently than I do. And that's why I'm hiring you, because I want that from you. All right. So today, and before we get to our trivia quiz, um, I want you to use terminology from the job criteria that match your experience. Always think of function first, like what do you want it to do, and then build your creative so it's compelling, so you change behavior. And please proofread. And he here's the trick. When you say something or read something, and in your head you're like, well, I've always said that. I've always known that. My family's, that's the word they use. Please look it up. And don't just Google it or whatever engine you're using and pick the first thing. Go to the source document, whether it's a Merriam-Webster or an Oxford English Dictionary. Make sure you look to see why we're saying something that way. Um, I had somebody who's you know in their 40s. We were, I was at a you know business luncheon, and you know how conversations just go. And somebody said, "Oh well, much to the chagrin of my husband, my my parents needed you know him to look at the engine. He was a mechanic." And in my head, I'm like, much to the chagrin. Um, I, I, go, I, I go, I'm sorry. I said, um, why was your husband embarrassed? So, well, he wasn't. And I go, in my head, I'm like, well, that's what chagrin means. Um, 
she thought it meant to his dismay or, you know, it was troublesome to him, like it was an inconvenience. That's what she thought the word meant. And, and, I, and it, I didn't, you know, you don't want to embarrass people. And I thought, I wonder why that is. But then it occurred to me, it's, if you hear something all the time, it's normal to you. So why would you look it up? But for your own sake, think of the, you know, Procter & Gamble example. Please look something up before you finalize it. Even if you think you know, get the confirmation. It takes two seconds. And had I have done that, I would be the most successful person selling Pampers to this day. <laughs> oh, Procter & Gamble, one, the one that got away. All right. So, I, and I taught you how to ask questions, so that's good. And then always invite the feedback, always. All right, so here's our trivia. And, um, and then, oh, you guys didn't ask me questions along the way, so we're going to do that too. Um, for the trivia, I have um, two books, so there'll be two, two answers. It's called Enjoy the Grind. It's a recent publication, and it's how to navigate stress, master your mindset, and create happiness in your 20s. So it's, it's an excellent book. I actually read it because I gave it um, to my cousins. They graduated, and I wanted to give them something. But I wanted to read it, you know, so I wouldn't be kind of random, like, why give me this book? Um, but it's really nice for overachievers. All right, so here's the trivia. Get ready to shout out. So in 1983, I'm sorry, 1939, <laughs> 1939, Montgomery Ward. Now, Montgomery Ward was like a Sears, was like a Macy's back in the day. Montgomery Ward himself, the man, asked a copywriter to develop a Christmas story to give away a booklet. Coloring books were a big deal when kids came to see Santa. All right, so start thinking. I wonder what this could be. The main character, his name could have been Rolo, but it was too cheery for a misfit. And Reginald, but that was just a little too British. Who said that? Keep, keep, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I see ya. I, all right. <laughs> this group, I'm telling you. All right, so it was printed in, it was reprinted in 1947 and developed for theaters as a nine minute cartoon. Nine minutes. And then it became a live stop action movie, premiered in 1964, and is a favorite Christmas movie. <laughs> Rudolph! Rudolph! <laughs> Yay! All right, well, come get your book. And someone over here yelled it too. Did you say it? Oh. I thought somebody over there yelled it. No? Did someone over there yell? Honor system. So, who else yelled? No? I thought someone yelled it over there. Whew. All right. Thanks, Dr. Caldwell. All right. So with all that, we have a few minutes. We can take a few, and if not, I'm going to be here for a little bit. You can chat with me afterward, but please use your time here at Defiance to really build who you want to become. Use it to your advantage so you can really build your career, and make good decisions. They always won't be right, but know that you went through a process to make good decisions. All right, who's first on a question? Anybody? Oh, no one's going to be for, I just showed you how to ask questions. Really. I'm disappointed in this group. See? All right. It's been an hour. They're restless. Oh. So when you're scanning through a resume, what are the main things that, like, jump out to you if you were looking to hire someone? I love, the question is, you know, what do you look for in a resume? I love students from a small college because I know they're cross-disciplined, you know, they, they know how to problem solve, they've been working in teams, they have communication, uh, well, they have communication techniques. I feel like you guys are good at that. Um, but really, it's about being well-rounded. You just don't have one thing. I, I want to see that you tried some things. You know, what did you do at school? Were you just a, 
you know, a bookworm or do you have a couple activities that you want to include? That's the best thing to do. Because again, I know you're just graduating. I don't expect you to have my resume. I expect you to have your resume. I know that. So do things outside of your comfort zone. Build, try things. It's, it's good. You don't have to be the bulldog costume. You don't. <laughs> that did not help my resume. All right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, doll. Yes. Oh, the question was that I do internships when I was in college. We didn't really have those a lot back then. Um, I did not, but I had a lot of jobs. You know, just had to work and pay for school. So those, those helped me. Yeah. All right, Dr. Taylor. I, the students can find me. They need me. Yay for me! All right, uh, I'll tell you what, um, let's give another round of applause for Gina. I think she did a great job. You know, I, for those of you that have, all, that, have all, that have had me in class, you know that one of the things I always tell you when you're writing your papers is that the most dangerous thing in the world is a college freshman and a thesaurus, right? Because you look up words and don't, she echoed what I'm saying, don't just look words up and don't know what they mean, right? The other thing too is, you know, all that advice that she gave, take it to heart, use it. It'll make you very successful. Um, so, um, I really wanna thank Gina, you did a great job. I can't think of any, any better way for us to kick off, uh, kick off Jackie Days 23. Um, the other great thing, that uh, Gina did is she's gonna she she we finished a little early so you're gonna have a little bit extra time, which I know that you all are sad about. But before we go, uh, before we go, I do want to do a, give a couple of reminders. Um, remember that tomorrow 8:45 is the kickoff session. We'll start off here in Schaumburg. Um, we also uh, at tomorrow at 8:45 at the kickoff session. We'll announce the winners for our Dress for Your Career contest. Um, remember, take a selfie. I don't know if the 201 students know this, but uh, take a selfie, dress up like you think, like what your career is going to be. Take a selfie, post it to Instagram, Twitter, as other two, or do we got Snap, Grant, Snapchat or whatever? Okay. Well, you post it to. I don't think I don't think you're going to post it to Facebook because that's where us old people are. But Twitter. Instagram, um, post it up there. Hey, listen, tag uh, MySpace. Yeah, I, I still rock my MySpace. Uh, tag it to Jacket Careers, right? And then use the hashtag Jacket Days 23. We'll be giving away, uh, we'll announce the, the winners tomorrow morning. Um, and then we'll announce the contest for the next day as well. The other thing, remember, we are having a dodgeball tournament tomorrow. Um, the honors program is going to be running that dodgeball tournament. There is still room for teams to sign up. Put together your team of five. I don't know if you all saw on Twitter or, or Instagram, but team policies and procedures, which is student life, they're calling all you students out. They're ready to bean you students in the head with a ball. So get a group. Hang on, everybody. Hey, the, the sooner, if y'all listen for a few minutes, we'll be done. All right. So if you, you want to participate, unless you're scared, scared of Dean Marshallek just blah, throwing one at you, right? <laughs> unless you're scared. Sign up. We got room for a few more teams. Team of five. You need to have a team name. We'll be giving prizes away. First, second, third place. And we'll give prize away for the best team name and cost or best team spirit and best costumes. Um, finally, 
listen, hey, everyone, I, I got to last for three days, so I don't feel like yelling. All right, finally, okay, make sure that you go through your program tonight. If you don't understand what your requirements are that you need to complete for this class, you need to ask questions, okay? You need to ask questions. Don't wait until Thursday and say, Dr. Taylor, I mean, I didn't know I was supposed to do anything. I ain't got nothing for you there. If you, if you don't understand what you're supposed to do, ask questions. If you are still having trouble, if you're having trouble scanning QR codes, you need to come over to the information table in Sarek after this and we will get you taken care of. The only way that you're going to get credit for attending events is by scanning the QR code, right? So make sure that you've got it set up, okay? So the career will we'll be over at the Enseric Center until about 4 o'clock if anybody's got questions. If you need help with anything, we're there. For those of you that are in Gen 301 that have an etiquette dinner tonight, remember that starts at 6 o'clock and Hubbard Banquet Hall, all right? Thank you all for your well attendance. We will see you all on tomorrow.